Wario. My name's Wario. Some people call him Wario. These people should be exiled from society. I miss the Wario Land games, dude. Don't get me wrong, WarioWare is a fantastic series of games, and I can't think of a Nintendo franchise that more unapologetically wears the personalities of its devs on its sleeve. And fun fact, I even think I have WarioWare DIY's music maker to thank for me becoming a musician. But did WarioWare really have to replace Wario Land? They offer way different things. I mean, even barring the fact that the gameplay is night and day, I think there's a side of Wario the character you don't really get in the WarioWare games. Wario is funny as a greedy, oafish corporate CEO, but I want to see the Wario that goes out and hunts for treasure and beats the fuck out of people. So you've read the title, you know the main topic of this video is going to be Wario Land 4, but funny enough, I think the Wario game that I've played the most and thusly have the most personal connection to is probably 2003's Wario World for the GameCube, which is a little different from the other Wario games in that it's a beat-em-up rather than the usual puzzle platformer, but even the fact that there was a point where Wario was considered a viable candidate for the player character in a beat-em-up only serves to enforce that, like, there used to be a kind of toughness to Wario that's been a little lost in recent years. Wario World was actually developed by, fittingly enough, a company called Treasure, who are only the greatest video game studio of all time bar none, and as is Treasure's specialty, the boss fights are definitely the most interesting and creative parts of Wario World. Wario World's universe sort of exists in the same purgatory as stuff like Super Mario RPG, it being a Mario spin-off that has a bunch of weird characters and enemies they made up specifically for that game, which never appeared in any other game again, and so many of these characters are just like... Hey, scary beyond all reason. Yeah, that's it. But there's something both absolutely absurd and weirdly comforting and cathartic about the fact that, like, the crux of the game is Wario kicking all of their asses into next week. Wario doesn't care if you're an extra-dimensional Lovecraftian chaos being, he will grab you and beat you to death with his bare hands. Nintendo owes the success of their company to the fact that they've spent decades cribbing from the character dynamics of Popeye, and the original intent of Wario was to replace Donkey Kong's spot as the Bluto to Mario. And nowhere is that idea more fully realized than Wario World. I'm a number one. Wario is goofy, but he's also kind of a badass, and like I said, that's something about Wario we don't see much of anymore. After about seven years of the Wear games basically taking the Wario spot on Nintendo's docket, they did briefly try to bring the Land series back on the Wii with 2008's Wario Land Shake It, or Wario Land the Shake Dimension if you're from the UK, or just Wario Shake if you're Jason Sudeikis. What the hell is this thing? Uh, it's called Wario Shake. A uh, masturbation joke? masturbation reference? I'm not even one of those people who hates SNL. They're always gonna have hits and misses, but maybe they should stop trying to write sketches involving Wario. It never seems to go well. But look, Bill Hader likes Haosu. I'm at least willing to forgive him for this. Shake It was actually outsourced to Goodfeel, who would later do stuff like Kirby's Epic Yarn and Yoshi's Woolly World. The art and animation in Shake It is fucking incredible, and it was handled by the anime studio Production IG, who you might know for, like, Ghost in the Shell and helping Studio Gainax out on End of Ava and Fooly Cooly. It sucks to say though, but like, Shake It was kind of a miss for me. It's not even a bad game, I just thought it was kind of boring, and it definitely lacks the weird, crazy personality of the other Wario games. I do have to at least mention the soundtrack though, especially the music for Mount Lava Lava, which is legitimately one of the nastiest funk tracks I've ever heard. Also, it does have Captain Syrup in it. Who doesn't love Captain Syrup? <laughs> But even though I maintain Wario World is still probably my personal favorite, I admit it took me far too long to really appreciate the genius of 2001's Wario Land 4. It's no wonder a lot of people refer to it as Wario's greatest, you know. It did come before Wario World, but it could still be seen as the swan song of the Land games. But enough gallons of ink have been spilled on how great the gameplay and design is. What I really want to focus on is like, its style and presentation. You can clearly see a stylistic transition happening between the land games and the wear games here, and I think this might be the land game with the most overt personality, and also the weirdest and most experimental. This also goes hand in hand with it being like, 
a huge flex from a technical standpoint. With a lot of the stuff Wario Land 4 gets away with graphically and sonically, you'd think it was a game that came late in the Game Boy Advance's life, when devs knew the hardware backwards and forwards and were willing to push it to its limits, but believe it or not, Wario Land 4 came only about five months after its launch, which is pretty early. That still blows my mind. I think, though, the aspect I most want to explore is the game's sound design, because I think that's an element of Wario Land 4 that most exemplifies everything that makes it great technically, stylistically, and artistically. I have a theory that Wario Land 4 may have been kind of a dream project for the sound team. Like, as someone with experience in music and sound stuff, I honestly believe Wario Land 4 is the kind of game that any sound designer or musician would sell their body parts on the black market for even a chance to be able to work on. Why do I believe that? Well, I'll tell ya. White guy making 6 to 27 minute videos about increasingly esoteric obsessions. What an original concept, the original concept, no one's ever done it before. What an original concept, the original concept, no one's ever done it before. Funding for Geno7 projects is provided in part by esteemed members of the Geno7 Fun Club. Give me money, cause I like to stay alive, Geno7 Fun Club. Something I want to get out in front of right off the bat is there's an essay about Wario Land 4's sound design by Wario Forums user Tahu Toa that covers a lot of the same things I talk about in this video. I discovered a lot of this stuff independently though, and I wasn't aware of the essay before I started writing my video, and there is still a lot of stuff I talk about that the essay doesn't cover, and vice versa, so I'd say it works as a good companion piece to this video if you want to give it a read. Anyhow, finding any developer interviews related to Wario Land 4 was weirdly hard, but thankfully I did manage to dig up an interview with director Hirofumi Matsuoka, design team member Takehiko Hosokawa, and programmer Goro Abe. It was only in Japanese, so I had to use DeepL to machine translate it, but that still gave me a pretty decent idea of what they were saying, and there are some portions of the interview I want to highlight, because I think they illustrate two major things that are going to be a running theme in this video. First, the interview is full of the devs gushing about the Game Boy Advance's technical specs. Matsuoka talks about the system's processing power compared to the original Game Boy, Hosokawa talks about the sprite rotate and magnify functions, you get a vibe that they were really excited to get to stretch their legs on a system that was cutting edge technology at the time and seeing how far they could push it, the way a teenager might take their new Ferrari to do donuts in an empty parking lot, and it's definitely something that's reflected in the game. Second, the driving force behind the Wario games has always been a kind of subversive Versive punk rock attitude that takes the tropes of the Mario series and flips them on their head. There are parts of the interview where the devs talk about being able to get away with stuff that they'd never be able to do in a traditional Mario game just because it's a Wario game, so it would make sense that the game would have so many stylistic elements that feel like they're just there to be a middle finger to convention. For a good example of both of these things in tandem, let's start with Wario's voice. <laughs> The way Wario's voice acting is presented in this game is something I don't think I've ever seen done in quite the same way in any other game. When a character in a video game has voice acting, it's to create the illusion that the character is a real living being, and even though we as players know that a character's voice is just a bunch of audio recordings set to trigger at specific points, it's made to sound like they're, you know, coming out of that character's mouth, and that character is reacting to things that are happening to them. At times, Wario Land 4 seems like it's deliberately trying to eschew this convention. Something I really admire about the mechanics of Wario's voice in this game is like, they're way more complex complex and layered than they even remotely needed to be. Any sane sound designer would just have a bunch of voice clips that play at certain times in the game, but Wario Land 4 experiments with randomly manipulating the pitch of Wario's voice clips in real time. and even chopping up bits of his voice clips and mixing and matching them together. Here I go! Here I go! I go! Wow! Go! Every time Wario laughs in this game, it's just a single clip of him going ha, but repeated with the pitch sliding down each time. 
that's really inventive, and like one could argue this is a way the developers make Wario sound more human while being economical about the cartridge space they're taking up, but there are times I almost feel like it goes in the other direction, like maybe that the original intention of this real-time sound manipulation was to make Wario sound more human, but they were having so much fun that they decided to run with it and exaggerate it to the point that Wario is being made to sound deliberately not human. There are bits where Wario's voice has fucking stutter loop effects. Go, 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 go. Hey, go. Hurry up. There are bits where Wario's voice clips are so contextually randomized that he'll say yeah or laugh when he gets hurt. <laughs> or he'll grunt in pain when he finds a treasure chest. And this could maybe be attributed to a language barrier, but I don't think that's giving them enough credit. It feels like Wario's voice could be thought of less like a human saying things and more like a DJ chopping and screwing samples. I can see something like this working if Wario's character was like, I don't know, a robot with a glitchy broken voice modulator, but no, there's no diegetic reason for this. They're doing it just to fuck with you. <laughs> And that's kind of awesome. The idea of the game deliberately sabotaging its own immersion by calling explicit attention to the medium and practically shouting in the player's face, hey, Wario isn't real, this is just a bunch of samples. It's subversive, it's punk rock, it's Wario. There's something I want to explain here. Video game music used to come out of proprietary sound chips. You know, the characteristic bleeps and bloops of a console's sound hardware. But in the last 20 to 25 years, video game music has evolved to the point where there's basically two ways to go about having music in your game. Streaming music. And MIDI music. Streaming music means the whole song is just an audio file that the game plays. This is really helpful if you want your music to have more of a live sound because, you know, the audio file can be a live recording of someone playing, but it also takes up a ton of space, and there was a time when most cartridge-based systems couldn't really do streaming audio, which is why the Game Boy Advance uses MIDI music. MIDI music means that every song is basically a bunch of instructions that tell the game to play samples at specific times and pitches in real time. Though MIDI music and sampling technology has improved exponentially over the years, MIDI music generally sounds a little bit more stilted and artificial than if your song is a pre-recorded audio file of a human actually playing it. But the fact that MIDI files are just a bunch of data means that they both take up way less space and make it much easier to do what's called adaptive music. Adaptive music, or dynamic music, is when the music in a game is manipulated in real time to correspond with things that are happening in the game, usually player actions. Adaptive music is kind of one of Nintendo's signature things, and they'd been doing it for a long time, even before MIDI technology became the standard for sequenced music. You can see the evolution of this throughout the Mario series. The original Super Mario Bros. did more basic stuff like uh, having the music change when you get a Star Man, or speeding up the music when you're running out of time. But Super Mario World would experiment with slightly more technical stuff, like adding a bongo drum track to the music when you're on Yoshi. Until by Yoshi's Island, you've got stuff like the Touch Fuzzy Get Dizzy level, which adds an oscillating pitch warping effect to the music to signify Yoshi is fucking turned. But from the Nintendo 64 era onward, MIDI technology became the standard for sequenced music, and it coincides with Nintendo starting to push the idea of adaptive music to its logical extreme. And this is where Wario Land 4 comes in. The insane lengths to which Wario's in-game status modifies the music is something that I think gives the game a ton of character and makes it feel alive. There are the more obvious things like how Wario's transformations will do different combinations of things to the music, uh, changing the pitch or speed or adding that oscillating pitch warp effect similar to Yoshi's Island. The music also speeds up whenever Wario is rolling in a ball. What pushes it over the edge to me, though, are the subtler things that most players may not even notice. For example, several of the levels have different sections of music that only trigger when you're in certain parts of the level, and it's hard to pick up on because the transition is usually made totally seamless, like Palm Tree Paradise's music having a section that only plays when you're in the cave portion of the level.
Whenever you hit the ground in the game during a ground pound, there's a little wobble in the pitch of the music, almost like it's playing on a record player and you like bumped into it. <laughs> This is difficult to catch because it's usually covered up by the sound effect, but I swear it's there. You want to get fucking crazy nutso cuckoo bananas though? Every time Wario crouches, the music plays slightly slower. I feel like you could probably go several entire playthroughs of the game without even noticing that. Here's the kicker though, if you stand completely still without moving for long enough, this happens. There are so many times where this game just like does shit and refuses to explain itself, and that's kind of why it rules. Naughty. A dude named Ryoji Yoshitomi is the only person listed in the credits as having done the music, and the fact that there aren't any other sound-related credits in the game and Yoshitomi has a ton of credits on other games doing both music and sound effects leads me to believe that Yoshitomi was responsible for all of Wario Land 4's sound effects too. It would make sense because there seems to be a level of stylistic consistency between the game's music and sound design, and the game is unique in that there are even a lot of parts that blur the line between what could be considered music and what could be considered sound effects. But uh, we'll We'll get to that later. As someone who's never actually done music on a AAA console game, I often wonder how much actual programming knowledge is usually required of a game composer, especially in a game like Wario Land 4, where so much adaptive music would seem to behoove a composer to have a level of programming knowledge. But given Yoshitomi's credits on other games include stuff like sound director and sound programmer, it may be safe to assume that he was also responsible for a lot of the more technical ways sound is treated in the game, you know, all the reactive live manipulation stuff. Stuff. And if so, fucking hell yeah, this guy rules. It is a little bit of a shame that as Nintendo got bigger and more ambitious with sound, the sound crews of games got larger and larger, and older staff members like Yoshitomi, who at one point were solo composers with singular creative visions, gradually started getting smaller and more advisory roles on larger sound teams. I mean, I get it though, games have bigger budgets and usually more music now, and one composer tackling an entire game is a lot of work, but it's a bit of a different vibe than when one composer gets to just handle everything and go apeshit. In any event, given the music and sound design in Wario Land 4 seem so interconnected, I want to transition into talking a bit about the music. In the interview, the devs mentioned that a really significant portion of the cartridge capacity is taken up by songs, and I believe it. It would seem to me that the most prominent genres in Wario Land 4's music are like blues and soul, with this being the game that pretty much cemented Hammond organ and brass as Wario's bread and butter. But this is a soundtrack that, while still surprisingly cohesive, is about as eclectic and uncategorizable as it gets. You've got some folk, you got some country, some funk, some jazz, some drum and bass, some metal, you even got experimental ambient soundscapes, noise music, what might be called music concrete if that's even an applicable term, but again, we'll get to that. It's always immensely fun for me to try to use my music knowledge to see if I can pick out what genres and artists outside of game music may have influenced the soundtrack of a game. Though I'll be the first to admit that funk, blues, and soul are all sort of blind spots for me, so feel free to beat my ass in the comments if something I say sounds incorrect. But I think about as far as I can tell, the music for Hall of Hieroglyphs seems to bear a passing resemblance to Green Onions by Booker T and the MGs. And the cacophony of clock bells whenever you step on a frog switch sounds to me like a nod to Time by Pink Floyd. The funk-laden sound of Fiery Cavern seems comparable to something Casey and the Sunshine Band or Graham Central Station might do. Yeah. 
and Toy Block Tower seems to really crank up the soul influence. It probably reminds me most of Everybody Needs Somebody to Love, originally by Solomon Burke, but it sounds closer to the more well-known Blues Brothers version. <laughs> Apart from that stuff though, Wario Land 4 was admittedly kinda stumping me. That was until I saw a video on Wario Land 4 by a guy named Loot. It's a great funny video and I definitely recommend it if you're wanting a Wario Land 4 video that's a bit more linear and covers more aspects of the actual gameplay. There is a brief section where he talks about the game's music and sound design though, and he lists a chart of albums that personally remind him of Wario Land 4's soundtrack and suggests some of them may have been influences on it. I don't know if I'd ever actually heard any of these albums in full before, but I'm really glad I listened to them. These are all fantastic albums, and Loot has some killer music taste. I spent a lot of time going through them and trying to hear the Wario in them. With most of these albums, there aren't a ton of direct compositional comparisons you could make to specific songs in Wario Land 4, it's more of a feel or a texture that comes off Wario Land 4-ish, but either way, these are just a few of my findings. Herbie Hancock's 1973 fusion jazz funk classic Headhunters pretty much immediately sounds Wario-ish to me. The squishy synth bass on the song Chameleon is extremely similar to a specific synth bass sample that gets used all the time in Wario Land 4, to the point that it almost sounds like Wario Land 4 directly sampled it from Chameleon. But it sounds just different enough that it's probably not the case. Miharu Koshi and Haruomi Hosono's 1996 album Swing Slow is space-age lounge jazz with synthetic instrumentation that gives it kind of an uncanny plastic sound that I really like. Good morning, Mr. Echo. I hear Swing Slow in a lot of the jauntier, more swingy Wario Land 4 songs like Palm Tree Paradise and Domino Row. The 2000 album Gift by Hanayo was one of my favorite discoveries out of Lute's chart, and it definitely makes me want to check out more stuff by this artist. The mood of the album seems to range from melodic and quaint to like downright terrifying at times, and that shit is totally my jam. <laughs> Gift sounds like the weirder, more experimental side of not only Wario Land 4's music, but its sound design as well. I hear Wario Land 4 in Gift's sparse, clicky drum machines, its groaning synths, and its squishy bass sounds, but there are a lot of instances of noise manipulation that wouldn't sound out of place as Wario Land 4 sound effects. Also, really often, the eerie way Hanayo's vocals are processed makes them sound like they could be coming out of a Game Boy Advance, making them sound uncannily like vocal samples from Wario Land 4. I highly doubt this was deliberate though, because like, Hanayo is clearly filtering her vocals like this for an artistic reason, while the vocals in Wario Land 4 are weird and crushed for technical reasons. Still, it's a really serendipitous effect. The 1989 album Boomerang by The Creatures is a really interesting listen. It seems to just combine a lot of the same ingredients that Wario Land 4 would later end up combining. We're talking the usual squishy synth bass, there's also a lot of brass, some weird jaw harp, that really specific electric piano sound, and drums that sort of oscillate between the more sparse drum machine sound and really frantic, crowded, exotica style percussion. All of this is stuff I definitely associate with Wario Land 4 in one way or another. 
but the album that probably surprised me the most with just how much it sounds like Wario Land 4 was probably Bjork's 1993 album debut. There are so many ways this album is sonically a dead ringer for Wario Land 4 that it really does make me wonder if Ryoji Yoshitomi was influenced by it. The rolling snare is accented by timpanis and human behavior seem to foreshadow the little drum beat that happens when the store clerk uses one of your items before a boss fight. Later on in the song, we get some really robotic and stilted uses of a distorted guitar sample that sounds eerily similar to the way Wario Land 4 uses its distorted guitar samples. Airplane has like swamp ambience throughout, and that combined with the song's laid back rhythm seems to suggest monsoon jungle. There's also a lot of vibraphone samples on both Airplane and Crying, which I swear are the same Roland Sound Canvas vibraphone samples that get used throughout Wario Land 4. The biggest kicker though, big time sensuality. This song just fucking sounds like it came straight out of Wario Land 4. I mean, the organ, the brass, the synth bass, the kind of new jack swing beat sounds like the title screen music, but apart from that, there just isn't really a specific Wario Land 4 song this sounds like. It just kind of has Wario Land 4 written all over it. I mean, doesn't it? Am I crazy? I did make a Spotify playlist of a bunch of the songs I thought sounded like Wario Land 4 in one way or another, which is a combination of cherry-picked stuff from Loot's album chart and some of my own observations. I'll link it in the description, and if anyone in the comments has any suggestions for songs to put there, feel free to let me know. So you remember me saying MIDI music in video games is a bunch of data that tells the game to play samples at specific times and pitches. You might be wondering then, where do said samples come from? Well, in most cases, samples come from stuff like keyboards, sound modules, and CDs of licensed stock sound effects and samples. If you've ever wondered why you often hear the same sound in multiple different games, it's because all these things are commercially available for anyone to buy and use. And there were a lot of sample packs and CDs that were super commonly used in the games industry around this time. Well, it's the lyrical paragraphs, your tracks make me laugh, your front of the mic. Funny enough, you could probably say the main reason we know about this stuff now is because of comedic collaborative music project Siva Gunner. It inadvertently jump-started a passionate community of people who comb through game soundtracks and attempt to identify the sources of every sample. At first this was for the express purpose of doing shit like replacing the main riff in the Delfino Plaza theme with snow halation, but it eventually became its own thing for archivists and music nerds. Another thing people started doing was like using this information to make remastered versions of video game music. Samples on older hardware obviously have to go through a lot of crusty compression to stay economical about storage space, but if you have access to the original samples used to make a song, you can recreate it from scratch in the highest possible quality. A person named Wiario did do this with Wario Land 4's soundtrack, and they did a pretty good job, especially with the absence of any kind of official soundtrack release, and most of the circulating audio files of the OST missing some bits or having traces of in-game sound effects. Though I will say there's something a bit off about a particular lead brass sample in these. I think it is the right sample, it might just be the way it's cut or the way the Advances hardware compresses it that makes it sound different. I think I did try messing around with it myself at some point, but couldn't get the results to sound much better, so I don't know. 
I mentioned it briefly before, but Wario Land 4 makes heavy use of the Roland SC8850 sound module, and this doesn't come as a huge surprise because the Roland Sound Canvas series of sound modules basically defined the sound of video games from the late 90s into the early 2000s. I mean, seriously, this shit got used everywhere, not even just in video games. It feels like around this time whenever anyone needed an orchestra sound but couldn't afford a real orchestra, the Roland Sound Canvas was the go-to. The game also uses a lot of weird stock vocal samples, one of my favorites definitely being this Dow sample, which appears to be from the third CD in a set called Spectrasonic's Vocal Planet. If you're a sharp-eared listener, you probably notice that another musician may have been digging around in the same sample CD. As if I thought this album couldn't get any cooler. I mentioned earlier that a significant amount of Wario Land 4's cartridge space is taken up by music, and it's probably because of one of my favorite things about Wario Land 4. It has songs with lyrics. That's right, fuck you, rental floss, this game already has them. I don't think there's anything more immediately charming to me than when a video game goes the extra mile and adds lyrics to one or more of its songs, and seeing it on a system like the fucking Game Boy Advance just increases the charm exponentially. It's another way the game really feels like the devs were having a ton of fun and passionately pushing the hardware capabilities as far as they could go. What grabs you right off the bat are the vocals in the intro music. These are actually a combination of stock vocal samples from two separate CDs, MIDI Mark Productions' Vocal Bites and Zero G's Vocal XTC. Here I come, look out, here I come. Put your hands up. Now work it, work it. Hearing these at full quality makes me feel like I'm meeting God. But Geno7, I hear you say, these are not real lyrics, they're just mixing and matching stock vocal samples. Well, alright, wise guy, why don't you take a listen to Meta Mayaki, or Sunny Side Up, otherwise known as the theme for Palm Tree Paradise. Hello there. A fully original lyrical song with vocals playing from your goddamn Game Boy Advance speakers. It's fucking awesome! There's something really bizarre and out of place about the fact that this is the first real level in the game most people visit after the tutorial, and it randomly has vocals and none of the other stage music in the game does, but I think the bizarre out of placeness is exactly what makes it work so well. So if the game's music is all MIDI, how the fuck did they have a vocal track that runs through the whole song? Well, you may have already figured it out, but they literally diced up the entire vocal track so that each syllable is a separate audio file, and then they just triggered them all in order. <laughs> Pretty large-brained, if I do say so myself. There are two female Japanese names listed in the credits under voice, Junko Yoshitomi and Ayumi Shimokawa. Frustratingly, neither are listed for specific contributions, so we can never truly know who did what, but given there are bits where WarioWare Inc. Mega Micro Games reuses bits of Metamiyaki's vocal track and Yoshitomi is in the credits of the game but not Shimokawa, I would assume that the main vocal bit was Yoshitomi. The hello there, hello there. at the beginning kind of sounds like a different voice actress, and to my knowledge it doesn't come from any pre-existing sample CD, so it's possible that's Shimokawa. This is supported by the fact that Shimokawa's only other credit is on a 2006 Nintendo Nintendo DS Kanji dictionary application called Kanji Sonomama DS Rakubiki Jiten, where she provided voiceover work in a pretty fluent American English accent. Hello. There. I'm getting off topic though. Fuck. Fuck. The game actually also has another vocal track, but let's put a pin in that because I want to save that for the end. For now though, I want to talk to you about what might be the centerpiece of the game's sound design from both a technical and artistic standpoint. So in every level of the game, there's a treasure chest with a CD inside. Once collected, these CDs can be listened to in a place accessible from the map screen called the Sound Room. Now, in any normal game, this would be a sound test, you know, where you could say play back the game's level music. Every level in the game has a CD, so each CD must be that level's music, right? 
But this is not a normal game. This is Wario Land 4. With a few exceptions, every CD is a completely unique piece of music that you don't hear anywhere else in the game. And not just any music. Experimental, electronic music, ambient music, noise music, sound collage. Okay, there's a lot of reasons why I love this. The sound room in Wario Land 4 is not only a deconstruction of the idea of a sound test, it strikes me as a deconstruction of the idea of unlockable bonus content in games. Usually there are like three routes most games go with unlockable content like this. Uh, there's meta stuff like a sound test or being able to look at behind the scenes stuff like production materials or concept art. There's flavor text like journal entries or other stuff that fleshes out the story of characters. Then there's stuff that directly affects the game. Unlocking a new level, character, gameplay style, difficulty level, ending, costume change, but I think Wario Land 4 is one of the only games I've played that has unlockable collectibles that aren't really directly related to the rest of the game in any of those ways. They're just meant to be experienced as pieces of art in and of themselves. You think it's weird that Blackstar released an album that you can only listen to on the podcast platform Luminary? Oh, you think it's weird that Kanye released an album exclusively on his STEM player? Well, I think Ryoji Yoshitomi has them both beat, because to hear his album, you have to get a goddamn Game Boy Advantage and beat Wario Land 4. Game Boy Advance? And it would be unique enough even if these were like normal songs, but they're songs that push the boundaries of what could even be considered music. Like I said, ambient sound collage is an abstract electronic experimentation make up the bulk of these. Noise and ambient music is another genre that's sadly a huge blind spot for me, so I don't think I could even begin to pick out artists that may have influenced this, but my closest guess might be someone like Nurse with Wound, maybe some Steve Reich. There's a lot of One of Tricks Point Never songs that sound like a few of these too, but he wasn't active in until four years after Wario Land 4's release date, so that rules him out as an influence. Maybe he was influenced by Wario Land 4. It isn't outside the realm of possibility that a lot of these may not even really have been influenced by specific artists, and were more driven by a desire to challenge and experiment with the limitations of the hardware, or to see just how close they could get an artificial MIDI soundscape to sounding uh, natural and human. But, like, the context in which these soundscapes are presented, as in-universe audio CDs, makes me inclined to believe that this stuff was influenced by musicians. Unless that's like part of the joke. Either way, if anyone in the comments has any suggestions for artists that may have influenced this music, I am all ears. Speaking of the presentation, works of fiction or art within works of fiction or art might be one of my favorite tropes, and I fucking love that each CD gets its own fake album art. It adds so much flavor, and it sort of fires your imagination wondering like, are each of these supposed to be singles, or are they each presumed to be one song off a separate album? If so, what would all the other songs on each album sound like? And I fucking love these little animations that play at the top during each CD. You get stuff like rudimentary animations of various objects manipulated with what look like Photoshop filters, and there's also real-life people dressed as Wario wiggling around, which I honestly find hilarious. According to the interview, these are all pictures of people who worked on the game. You also get cute little animations of the Mr. Game & Watch shopkeeper, and he's a DJ in one of them, which is also something I kinda find hilarious, because like, imagine bumping this shit at a dance party. Some of my favorites of these CDs actually seem to tell little stories with just sound effects. On the errand, we follow someone's footsteps as they walk through various locales, each with its own vivid ambient soundscape, and they blend into each other seamlessly. You really almost feel like you're physically walking through a busy city street, and then a harbor, then a swamp. A few of these sound like they're supposed to be conveying very specific things, but it can be hard to tell what that specific thing is. The short futon sounds like two people having an intense conversation through unintelligible whispers, and this conversation is occasionally interrupted by the sounds of doors repeatedly opening, playing random sound effects or ambience, and then closing. <laughs> This seemed to foster some of the most interesting and wide-ranging interpretations I've seen. 
Diff, who uploaded the track to YouTube, theorizes it may be about a disgruntled couple trying to have sex, but they keep getting interrupted by random stuff at their front door. But the comments of the upload are full of different theories. Isaac3002 suggests it may be about two children whispering to one another around bedtime and pretending to sleep every time their parents come in to check on them. Lemon-flavored spermicide theorizes it's about two people in a fridge or coffin who end up in a different place every time they open the door. And Glyn Hilton suggests it may be about two people trying to find their hotel rooms late at night and checking different doors, which I think may be the closest to what I think it could be. It's funny because, like, many times when a door is opened, the ambience would suggest the door is leading to not just a room, but a totally different locale. It sort of reminds me of that scene at the beginning of Yellow Submarine where they keep opening doors and finding gradually more absurd reality warping shit on the other side. It's all in the mind. The judge's feet does something I don't think I've ever heard any other piece of music do. Every instrument is played at a peculiar rhythm that speeds up exponentially and then stops, and I swear it's meant to sound like an object gradually losing momentum as it's bouncing on the ground. There really is an inherent musicality about the sound of an object bouncing that I never picked up on until I heard this, and it sort of messes with my head, because like, how is it that just the tempo at which a sample is played being altered in a specific way conjures such a vivid mental image of something bouncing? Is it just the power of associative memory? Soft Shell might be the only track on here that's actually, like, from the game? Well, sort of. It's an extended version of the music that plays in the bonus rooms. Personally, I've always found this song hilarious in its mind-numbing elevator music-esque banality, especially juxtaposed with how much pain you're inflicting on this poor old man just to get your big diamond. However, it is one of the few songs here where I may have found a clear influence. I mean, let me know if this sounds dumb, but it seems to be done in the style of minimalist composer Steve Reich, with its use of weird samples and short, repetitive phrases. There's even a Steve Reich song with kind of a similar riff. The moon's lamppost may sound sort of weird and scary at first, but something you may have guessed is it's actually Metamayaki backwards. This is a more impressive technical achievement than you might think, because like, if Metamiyaki were an audio file, you could just reverse it, but remember, every song is a bunch, bunch of data, data that tells the game to play samples, samples at specific, specific times. Time. So it makes me wonder, did they have to manually input every note of the song backwards, or did they maybe write an algorithm that reversed the order of the notes automatically? I don't know if there's a way to tell. If you actually record the moon's lamppost and play it back in reverse, it doesn't sound like Metamiyaki one to one. This could be for a combination of reasons. While the placement of the notes is indeed musically backwards, I've gone back and forth over whether the actual samples they play are reversed, and it sounds like some of them are, but some of them aren't, and some may just be like sonic palindromes that sound the same when reversed. The fact that the song has a subtle delay or echo effect on it may also be affecting it, because that gets reversed when I reverse the recording. Does any of this make sense? Ah, uh, whatever. Do you remember when I said that, like, Wario Land 4 is the kind of game that would be a dream project for any sound designer or musician? The sound room is probably the biggest reason I think that. Imagine getting the level of freedom that would allow you to just go fucking nuts and do insane experimental shit like this. I don't want to understate the amount of hard work that goes into something like this, but like it still feels like in every aspect of the game's sound design, you get the sense that Ryoji Yoshitomi was taking full advantage of the rare opportunity he had and just fucking loved working on this game. The soundtrack may be totally off the wall and even esoteric, but something about it also feels deeply personal, and you can feel an unmitigated passion for music and sound effects in every note, every chopped voice clip, every weird pitch bent sample, and it reflects the passion that's felt through every aspect of the game, from the convention-breaking gameplay to the wild mixed-media graphics. 
and this passion is infectious. Even though I still think I have a deeper personal connection to Wario World, I can see why Wario Land 4 is a lot of people's favorite of the series. It's also neat that it seems like it's been growing more appreciation in recent years, and that magical thing is happening where the kids who grew up playing it are making games of their own. Currently in development indie titles like Pizza Tower and the Anton games use Wario Land 4's gameplay style and ethos as a jumping off point and combine it with different influences to create something new and fresh. The sound department in these games are no slouches either. Yes, you can hear a lot of samples directly from Wario Land 4, but often chopped up, recontextualized, and combined with samples samples from other sources. Pizza Tower's OST often seems to lean into Wario Land 4's new Jack Swing influences and combines it with stuff like Hideki Naganuma style Big Beat. An Anton Blast often augments Wario Land 4's musical style with really crunchy sounding wavetable synthesis. which seems to accentuate the game's nods to a Virtual Boy Wario Land. It's also cute that the game mimics the way Wario Land 4 handles Wario's voice clips. You can even hear them using the same pitch-bent laughing trick. <laughs> so, the spirit of Wario is thankfully alive and well, and I'm excited to see where these projects go. To close out, though, I want to come back around to the topic of vocal tracks. So, the game's ending credits music is another example of the game flexing with a lyrical song. It's interesting because there are actually two almost totally different ending credits songs depending on whether you're playing the international version or the Japanese version. The Japanese song has who I assume is Junko Yoshitomi coming back for one more verse. <laughs> But the international song actually brings in a male vocalist by the name of James Mesber to sing vocals in English. Mesber's performance is amazing, and like, I'm not gonna lie, I really love these lyrics. I guess it's kind of a My Bloody Valentine situation where there's never been an official transcript of the lyrics released by Nintendo, but this is the interpretation fans seem to generally agree on, and it sounds right to me. And if you're curious, YouTube commenter the Escapeologist 2110 did a transcription of the Japanese lyrics, and I cross-checked them with Deep L and a friend of mine who is smarter than me and speaks Japanese, and like, the lyrics of the English version are, for the most part, surprisingly faithful to the lyrics of the Japanese version. When you're translating the lyrics of a song, you have a devil's choice to make between preserving the rhythm and preserving the meaning, and I can't put into words how endearing it is that the song's meaning was so important to them that they went out of their way to modify the song's melody so that it would work better. I think with Nintendo of America's marketing at the time and their perception of Wario and whatever, it feels like it would have been easy to have lyrics here that were like, I don't know, snarky or comedic or goofy. Or it could have even ended up a jump up superstar situation where like descriptions of moment to moment Mario gameplay are forced into corny romantic metaphors. And there are examples of that sort of thing working exceptionally well, but jump up superstars lyrics come off a bit on the nose for me. I know, I know, beat my ass in the comments. But look, instead of doing that, the English lyrics for Wario Land 4's credits are like oddly poignant and in so few words. The concept of waking up from a really good dream and struggling in vain to hold on to the fading memory of that dream before finally accepting the memories left you is so universal, and as someone who has an odd obsession with dreams, it's something I myself must have experienced hundreds or even thousands of times in my life, but I don't think I've ever heard a metaphor for it that quite matches the surreality and even beauty of the dream melting into your pillow. And there's another layer to it that strikes me as a whimsical metaphor for someone coming to grips with the sudden loss of something dear to them that they may have taken for granted. It's ironic given it underscores Wario greedily making off with hordes of treasure, but that irony somehow makes it even more affecting to me. 
This is a fucking Wario game on Game Boy Advance, dude. Why am I crying? Lucas, look, low level play. If you get the game's worst ending, well, sorta, it's complicated. This music actually seeks into the music from Hall of Hieroglyphs, over which we get Mesber rapping, or I guess almost doing kind of a beatnik style spoken word. And what he says here is actually a sort of reprise of these lyrics, but with a little bit added at the end. <laughs> The lyrics that are unique to this part are a bit harder to make out, and they're more contested among Wario Land 4 fans, but they seem more overtly absurdist in an almost I am the walrus way, but it sort of adds to the dream theme of the song, almost makes me wonder if it's like the guy describing what he remembers about his dream. I don't know, something to think about. I wish I knew who the fuck wrote these lyrics though, and who was responsible for translating them. It would seem likely that Ryoji Yoshitomi himself wrote them, and the only English name I can find in the credits apart from voice actors is a W. Trinan at the end of the special thanks, which more than likely stands for William Bill Trinan, a longtime English localizer at Nintendo. Bill! So he seems like the most likely candidate. I'm not sure if we'll ever know for sure though, but I can't think of anything more fitting to close out the game with than yet another example of something that by all accounts had no business receiving the level of sheer passion and care it ultimately received. So many people poured their hearts out on this little game and I love it. So maybe the next time you feel like popping Wario Land 4 into your SP, take the time to listen a little closer. Anyway, bye guys, bye, don't forget to subscribe, the next episode will be me using the toilet, oh my goodness guys. Oh.